So good evening, everybody. I think we'll get started. De la part de nos chercheurs et notre équipe, je vous souhaite une uh, grande bienvenue. So welcome, everybody. And um, um, my name is Ruth Slack. And in case you didn't know, this is Brain Health Awareness Week. And all week, we've had presentations on different topics like navigating the world of memory and dementia. We've had great talks, and yesterday we had stroke night. And for tonight, we're um, going to talk about moving with multiple sclerosis. 
And the Brain and Mind Research Institute actually has a major pillar that's focused on multiple sclerosis research, where we have multidisciplinary teams of researchers working together to look for new treatments for multiple sclerosis. And we have international leaders as the pillar lead for the multiple sclerosis team. So I'll just introduce the uh, two uh, pillar leads that actually lead the multiple sclerosis research here. And the first one is Dr. Mark Friedman, that probably most of you know, who's the director of the MS clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. And uh, Dr. Friedman has led groundbreaking research in the area of multiple sclerosis. Um, he's led a major study that was published, I think, two years ago, and it was on national television and everything, showing that following immune ablation, they could transplant autologous hematopoietic stem cells, which could facilitate lasting recovery after MS. And this really changed um, and led to a lot of um, further studies in this area. And so he is now leading Canada-wide uh, bone marrow transplant study for the treatment of MS and multiple other groups like international mesenchymal stem cell transplant study. So these studies have really paved the way for new treatments for multiple sclerosis. Um, the other co-lead for the MS pillar is Dr. Lisa Walker, and she's a clinical neuropsychologist who studies cognitive fatigue and cognitive health in patients living with MS. She's also a professor at the School of Psychology at Ottawa U and also at Carleton University, and she, again, is the co-lead of the MS pillar. So it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Walker. So hello everybody and uh, welcome to uh, Brain Health Awareness Week 2019. Before I get started, I just wanted to thank some of the hardworking people that have uh, helped put this week together. There are many people that have done so, but some special mentions go to Natasha Hollywood, Victoria Rasher, Candice Fortier, and Kim Sauvey. They've been uh, working very feverishly to, uh, to make things work. Um, so I just wanted to highlight uh, what Dr. Slack said, the MS research group with the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute tries to bring together researchers from across Ottawa from different institutions, so University of Ottawa, Carleton, uh, the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, the Ottawa Hospital, uh, the Royal, et cetera, et cetera. We are trying to work together um, to really move forward MS research in Ottawa. And so some of the projects um, Dr. Slack mentioned, the, um, the stem cell work that Dr. Friedman has done. We also have basic researchers that are doing, um, looking at cellular mechanisms that contribute to myelin damage. We're examining how biomarkers uh, and their activity can predict clinical outcomes. Um, and Dr. Paludi is working on uh, exercise and how that can benefit people with MS, and that's the focus of our evening uh, tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lara Paludi. She's a, a clinical exercise physiologist and a, and a professor at the um, Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. She obtained her PhD in kinesiology from McMaster University and then did a postdoctoral fellowship um, at the Exercise Neuroscience Research Lab at the University of Illinois. And we were uh, very pleased, it was quite a coup to get her to come to Ottawa and work with us here, so we're very pleased she joined us. Her research focuses on the role of exercise in the management and treatment of disability uh, in people with neurological disorders with a particular interest in MS. And she's really interested in how exercise can be adapted to benefit people with even advanced mobility impairments. Um, She's also uh, published over 80 scientific articles, and when you see how young she is, you'll see that, uh, what an accomplishment that is. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to have her here in Ottawa, and I invite you to join me in welcoming her to speak this evening. Everybody hear me okay? So, do 
I switch these or? Okay, that's okay. All right. Thank you, Lisa, very much for that kind introduction. And thanks again, everybody, for coming out this evening. Um, we're really excited to share some of the research and um, some of the things that are going on here, um, as well as a uh, focus this evening on exercise for people with MS. So um, as many as you probably know, here in Canada, we have one of the highest rates of multiple sclerosis in the world. Um, this has prompted um, posters, promotional materials, such as this one from the MS Society of Canada, world leaders in hockey, multiple maple syrup, and multiple sclerosis. We are also world leaders in Canada in the fight to end MS uh, with a number of innovative researchers and research programs across Canada as well as right here in Ottawa. So I'm very lucky to be part of this um, MS research pillar and the exciting research that we have going on here and to share a little bit more about uh, a focus on exercise tonight. So uh, throughout this um, talk, I'm going to provide a little bit of a background of where we've come when it comes to some of the initial thoughts about exercising for people with MS, how things have progressed, um, and what we currently know, and then what are some of the new and exciting areas that we are focusing on in the future. So the story starts with uh, a period of caution and concern about taking part in exercise. So um, a lot of the early beliefs, the early thoughts around participation in exercise for people with MS is that this would actually cause an increase in symptoms and potentially even cause flare-ups or um, new attacks that um, could make symptoms worse and could um, increase disease progression. And so many patients were actually cautioned against taking part um, in exercise and um, to not overexert themselves for a number of years. I just want to highlight that um, some results from a survey that was conducted by the MS Society of Canada in 2015. So this was a wellness survey looking at various different behaviors um, like diet, exercise, uh, emotional well-being. And what they found in this uh, Canada-wide survey was that about 20% of people who were living with MS reported that they were worried that activity would make their MS worse. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that there are still some concerns around participation in exercise. And hopefully as we move through and talking about some of the benefits, some of the research that we know, as well as some of the evidence that helps to support um, some of the safety of exercise for people with MS. So moving forward, um, the first randomized controlled trial that looked at uh, an exercise intervention for people with MS was in 1996. So this was led by a research group at the University of Utah, Dr. Jack Pettijan and Ed Gapmeyer. And so they conducted the first trial, a really high quality study, looking at uh, participation in aerobic exercise, um, cycling on this um, uh, aerodynamometer that was a uh, upper and lower body cycle. Um, and they participated in about 15 weeks of aerobic exercise. And what they found was that exercise was safe in this population, so there was um, no adverse events that were reported, but also there were a number of important benefits that were reported in this study as well. So improvements in things like cardiovascular fitness, so, um, or, or, or aerobic fitness, things like muscular strength and even blood lipid profiles, so changes in, in some of those markers in the blood that are associated with chronic disease risk. And also mood changes, so related to things like um, depression and, and anger. So this was really a seminal, um, seminal research piece and it helped to move the research field forward when it came to looking at exercise for people with MS. And so moving forward, if we take a look, this is a, a graph just showing the number of publications on um, keywords related to exercise training and multiple sclerosis. Early on here, kind of in the 90s and moving through the early 2000s, we see that there are about less than 10 publications per year in this field. So um, just kind of the early stages. As we move through into the 2000s and now into today, there's about 60 to 70 research articles published every year in the field of exercise in MS. So we've seen a huge expansion in terms of this field of research in the last uh, about 25 years. 
So with this additional knowledge base, with all of this information, we've been able to um, move forward and establish what are some of the benefits that we know um, for people with MS who are engaging in, in exercise. So these studies have um, collectively, we can, we can take a look at all of the evidence and, and what we know now about exercise participation for people with MS. And um, these are actually in a variety of different outcomes where they're all published from meta-analyses or systematic reviews. So we actually have quite a large evidence base within each of these different areas that support these beneficial effects. And some of the strongest benefits that we know are for improving physical fitness. So things like your um, strength, your aerobic capacity, which may translate into your ability to uh, carry out activities of daily living a little bit easier every day. Symptoms of fatigue. So if we think about some of the very earliest concerns about exercise participation, they were certainly around um, increasing things like symptoms of fatigue. Um, we now know that's one of the areas where we have some pretty strong evidence to show that participation in exercise can actually help to reduce those symptoms of fatigue um, and, and improve those long term. We see um, the evidence is a little less robust in these areas, but we do know that there are benefits for things like mobility, balance, depressive symptoms, all important outcomes to people who are living with MS, and we've shown beneficial effects from participating in exercise training. It's a little bit less clear when we get into a few other um, outcome measures, so surrounding things like cognition. Um, we've just recently started to get into this area and trying to understand what are some of the potential benefits of exercise training on um, cognition, so perhaps memory and, and thinking tasks. Similar with quality of life, and there's been a lot of mixed reviews in, in the literature related to this outcome, um, but there's a number of ongoing um, new reviews in this area that will, will help to um, elucidate some of those benefits. So uh, as well as having this large body of evidence, this has allowed us to take a look and go back to this question of safety of exercise participation for people with MS. So um, not too long ago, we took a look at all of the published randomized controlled trials, so those high quality studies where we were comparing people who participated in exercise versus those who did not participate in exercise in a prospective study design um, looking at exercise interventions. So we found 26 studies that followed that type of design and included almost 1,300 people with MS. And so what the results from that study showed us that when it looked at rates of relapse, okay, so that um, increase in symptomology and uh, disease progression indicator, people who did not exercise um, in those studies, 6% of them experienced a relapse during the course of the study intervention. Compared to people who did exercise, 4.6% of them can, um, did uh, experience a relapse. So it suggests at least that there's no increase when we look at this evidence base to date, um, no increase in the risk of relapse by participating in exercise from the evidence that we know so far. We can also look at the rate of adverse events. So any types of injuries that might be experienced when you take part in exercise. And so again, taking a look at people who did not exercise in these studies, about 1.2% 1 1 of them experienced an adverse event versus 2% of people who were in the exercise group. So the rate there was a little bit higher if you take part in exercise. You're more likely to experience a, an adverse event. However, a lot of these events were um, musculoskeletal types of injuries. So things like um, ankle sprains came up, there was some back pain that was identified, and some other um, illness flu-like symptoms that occurred. Um, these are not uncommon. Um, when we look at the general exercise literature, when someone is beginning an exercise program, particularly if they have not taken part in exercise before. Okay. So not unexpected and not that different than what we see in the general literature there. So hopefully this provides a little bit more evidence to um, support the safety of exercise and, and what we know based on the clinical trials to date. So um, moving along our timeline here and uh, gathering a little bit more evidence um, about the role of exercise for people with MS. In uh, 2013, we were able to take a look at all of the evidence that had been published to date to actually develop public health guidelines for people who are living with MS in Canada. 
So um, we proudly led the way in creating these uh, physical activity guidelines, the first of their kind, for um, specifically people who are living with MS. And so we scoured all of the literature that was available there. It was uh, a multi-stakeholder team of researchers. There were um, people from the MS societies that were involved, people from the Canadian Society for Exercise Physi Physiology, so a variety of different backgrounds that all came together to try to develop these um, guidelines. So what they tell us, if we take a look at the evidence, is that um, the recommendation is to take part um, for adults age uh, 18 to 64 who have MS, um, 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise twice per week, as well as strength training, so those types of exercise where we might be pushing, pulling, lifting things, for our major muscle groups two times a week as well. So what does that translate into, or maybe what does that look like? Um, so another piece that was developed that goes along with these guidelines is called the MS Get Fit Toolkit. Um, this information is available through the MS Society um, of Canada, and it provides a little bit more information on what moderate exercise might feel like, okay? what might be the types of aerobic exercise that someone could do. They also provide a, a variety of different options for people who are mobile and also for those who may be wheelchair users. So a few different options about how we could translate this information into everyday life. So moving forward, I'm going to touch on a few different perspectives about how we start to kind of change our thinking about traditional exercise prescription for people with MS. So one of the topics that's been a um, uh, really important area in the general literature over the last 10 years or so is the, the concept of sedentary behavior. So we're talking about any types of activities where we're sitting throughout the day. This might be the kinds of activities that uh, while we're driving from place to place at work, uh, leisure time as, as we're resting at home. So those are all different types of sedentary activity. And we know there's uh, quite a large body of evidence about the risks related to sedentary time and the amount of time that we spend in sedentary behavior. Okay? They're related to a variety of chronic diseases as well as um, all-cause mortality. So we took a look at the literature, what was out there in terms of in the MS population. And from that review, we saw that people with MS were sitting about 7 to 10 hours per day. This is not so different than uh, the rates that we see in the general population as well. There's pretty high rates of sedentary behavior across populations. But this perhaps provides an opportunity for a new way to think about getting people with MS to be active and moving beyond just um, the traditional kind of thinking about exercise prescription to the rest of the day where we may be sitting and we, could, we can change that behavior a little bit and try to be more active throughout the day. So this concept of lifestyle physical activity was introduced. And so lifestyle activity is a little bit different in that it's a type of activity that we might be doing um, throughout the day for transportation, walking from place to place. It could be the daily chores that we're doing at home, around the house. So different ways that we can just accumulate activity, be active in our daily routine rather than a structured exercise prescription. So we've seen this shift in um, a lot of different areas in terms of chronic disease management and in the general population away from traditional prescribed exercise and maybe thinking about how we can look at the rest of the day, kind of a whole of day approach to change the sedentary behavior and perhaps switch out that um, sedentary time for more activity throughout the course of the day. Um, so I'm very lucky to work with uh, Dr. Rob Model. He's one of our collaborators in the U.S. and he's been kind of pioneering this uh, this shift in the um, exercise, kind of the shift towards lifestyle physical activity for people with MS. And we've started to uh, explore this approach in a variety of different interventions that are delivered through the internet for people with MS that provide some of the tools, some of the techniques where we can learn how to change our daily routine, change our behavior patterns, to accumulate more physical activity and to sit less throughout the day. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from one of our other speakers about uh, this internet delivered lifestyle physical activity intervention. The last kind of new approach that I'm gonna to touch on is uh, high intensity interval training. So we've seen this as a trend in other 
populations. We see this as a, a general fitness trend over the last uh, 10 years or so. And what this means is essentially short bursts of very high intensity activity followed by uh, periods of recovery or rest in between. And it provides a way of actually kind of shortening and making a more effective or efficient exercise routine and still getting a lot of the same benefits for fitness outcomes and other health related outcomes. And it's been applied also in a variety of different chronic conditions like diabetes and, and obesity management. And so these are a number of studies that have actually been conducted in people with MS to try to translate this approach of high intensity or HIIT training for people with multiple sclerosis. So a review was published just last year, and at that point there were 11 trials that had looked at high intensity training um, in almost 250 people with MS. And so what the key thing they wanted to focus on there was, was this actually a safe approach for people with MS? So as we can imagine, there might be concerns again regarding the safety of this type of approach and participating in exercise at that high level of intensity. And so the general um, results from that trial that it was a safe approach. There were a few adverse events that were experienced in, that tr in the uh, review in all of those studies. And it was also very effective for improving fitness outcomes. So potentially another approach. Um, there's been some new trials that are funded through the National MS Society in the States that are now looking at applying this approach, um, even in people with MS with higher disability levels, using more adapted pieces of equipment and seeing if we can also apply that HIT training in those populations. So uh, collectively, we've seen kind of a shift towards um, lifestyle-based physical activity, some you know, promotion of wellness behaviors. We've seen that in the research, and that's been kind of moving the research field forward. But we've also seen a shift in funding priorities that have come along with this, which is really great to see. And that's largely been influenced as well by patient input. So a lot of the MS societies and funding agencies have sought feedback from people who are living with MS about what they want to see in terms of um, research. And um, there's been priorities related to wellness-based research. We've seen a shift in what are the research priority areas and um, large commitment of funding towards wellness-based research to look at different approaches for managing the many symptoms and consequences um, of MS. So let's move into the future and uh, where we're going with, this, um, with a few different directions in terms of exercise. So this figure here provides a graph of the pr typical progression, um, clinical course of the disease of MS. So we see kind of this early preclinical phase at the beginning before symptoms um, appear. We then typically, most people will um, enter into the relapsing remitting phase, which is characterized by these clinical relapses or attacks where we have um, an increase in symptoms and um, disease progression progressively over time there. And finally, a transition into the secondary progressive phase about 10 to 20 years after disease onset where those relapses tend to decrease and it's more of a, a gradual progression of disability. And so, what we know right now about exercise, what has been done, is primarily in this early disease phase. So um, early on, people who have relapsing MS and at fairly low levels of disability. What we don't know very much about is what's happening at the higher end of the disability spectrum later on in the disease course and uh, in this progressive phase of the disease. So. Um, some new areas to explore. We also know very little about what's actually happening in some of these underlying pathological factors related to the disease. So can exercise actually modify some of the things that are happening at the level of the central nervous system? Progressive MS has been um, a key focus of, uh, in research and funding priorities lately. It's been described as the greatest therapeutic challenge facing the MS community. We have very few um, therapies that are effective for patients with progressive MS, and um, we're searching for new approaches to, to manage this phase of the disease. Um, so we've taken a look a little bit about what's been done when it comes to exercise for progressive MS. We have um, several research studies that are targeting patients in the progressive disease phase. Taking a look at some of the evidence, what we've seen so far, and there are not many studies that have looked exclusively at patients who have progressive MS. So at the time when we wrote this review, there were um, only about nine studies published there. 
So the early evidence would suggest that there are potential benefits that um, are similar in some of the outcomes that we see compared to those who have relapsing MS or a lot of the other samples that are mixed for different disease courses. And those might be most related to things like improving fitness, symptomatic outcomes like fatigue, or quality of life. There are some new research efforts being put forward by the Progressive MS Alliance in a large clinical trial, multi-center, multi-international um, efforts looking at um, an exercise training program led out of the University of Toronto, and I think Marie's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, looking at disability level, so um, again, we've been focused on potential interventions as we move up that higher end of the disability spectrum. What can be some adapted approaches, more creative ways that we can deliver exercise for people with MS at, at higher disability levels? So how can we adapt the exercise to meet those needs? And we'll hear more from John about that as well. Lastly, I just want to touch on exercise as a disease-modifying therapy. This is one of, one of the hot topics in the field of exercise right now. And can we actually use exercise to modify the course of the disease? So we've seen some evidence related to physical activity levels and relapse rates. We've seen some really nice evidence out of um, Sick Kids Hospital, some of their um, imaging-based metrics looking at um, children with pediatric MS and those who participate in higher levels of physical activity actually have lower lesion uh, volumes and they have lower relapse rates over time. And so um, I'm borrowing this slide from one of my, my colleagues, Ulrich Dalgas from Denmark, and um, his suggested version of this clinical progression. And if we can actually modify it, so the traditional view being here in red, and can exercise actually modify this course over time so if, whoops, sorry, um, can, we, can we address things like this decrease in brain volume over time with exercise? Can we perhaps change that trajectory? Could we reduce the number and frequency of relapses over time and affect the actual progression of the disease? Lastly, we've seen some really interesting preclinical work. Um, this is a, a review that was just recently published from, from Wee Young's group in, at the University of Calgary. And they've actually started to explore um, at a more basic level what's going on in a preclinical model, looking at animals participating in exercise as wheel running or running on a, a mouse treadmill and taking a look at what's happening at the level of the central nervous system. And so we're seeing that there are some benefits there and some potential mechanisms related to actually repair within the central nervous system, protective effects, um, changing the actual inflammatory environment, and so further exploring what might be some of those underlying um, effects within the central nervous system. So take home messages here. Um, I hope you guys come away with um, the messages that uh, we know exercise is safe and we have some information out there about how to do it in a safe way and how to progress in a safe way. We have those guidelines and resources. We're happy to provide those to you and we can answer any more questions about that as well and, and how you can adapt exercise and make it work for you. Lastly, we have some really exciting research efforts. It's an exciting time to be in this field, I think, and um, to you know, address some of these key limitations that have been faced in the literature so far so that we can help to develop new solutions to address um, the many different challenges that people with MS are facing, and particularly those with progressive MS and higher um, disability challenges. Thank you. So um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker this evening, Marie Vaillant. Um, Marie was diagnosed with MS in 1996, and she began volunteering with the MS Society of Canada shortly after that. She joined the Ottawa Chapter Board in 2000 as a member at large, and she's had a number of leadership roles, um, including Director of Development, Vice Chair, and Chair. Marie has chaired the Ontario and Nunavut Board for the MS Society of Canada from 2014 to 2017 and has been involved with various different committees with the MS Society of Canada. In 2013, uh, Marie joined the Multiple Sclerosis International Federation Board and she was appointed vice chair in um, 2015. 
in uh, this month, actually, she's going to take on an exciting new role as chair of the MSIF, People with MS Advisory Committee. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto and is retired from Bell Canada, where she worked in marketing and international uh, um, alliances. Marie lives in Orleans with her husband, Gordon Keith, a graphic designer, artist, and an active volunteer and supporter um, for the MS Society of Canada. So please join me in welcoming Marie. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Paludi, for the introduction. As Lara mentioned, I have many roles in the MS Society of Canada and the MS International Federation. This evening, I'm here to speak as a person living with MS, for progressive MS, for 23 years. Before I begin, I want to stress that each person's experience with MS is unique, and my situation may not reflect your life on a daily basis. If I have one objective this evening is that you learn something that will help you live with MS and perhaps get you to look at exercise a little differently. My presentation will address my exercise regime, the research I have been involved with, current research that is exciting to me, and consideration for researchers when studying exercise and MS. I think we can all relate to this. Okay, you're ready to go on to less embarrassing weights. This is sometimes the way that I feel. When I was asked by Dr. Paludi to speak this evening about my experience with exercise, the irony wasn't lost on me. Exercise is the reason I was diagnosed with MS. In the 80s, I discovered fitness and I invested in Jane Fonda VHS tapes. I spent lots of time watching the tapes of her workouts while she extolled me to go for the burn. In the mid-80s, I joined the Downtown Y and became a regular fitness classes and also began volunteering at the Y as an aquafitness instructor. In 1996, I was working at Place Bell on Elgin Street and would walk down to the Y for lunch to do a step class. A couple of things started to happen. When I walked to the Y, about three quarters of the way there, I started to have difficulty walking. My view was that I needed a potassium fix, so my solution was to eat a banana, yet nothing changed. During step class, I started to trip and was experiencing what I now know is the dreaded foot drop, the symptom of MS. A few weeks later, I mentioned this to my family doctor and she referred me to a neurologist and six months later, I was diagnosed with primary progressive MS. The diagnosis of MS didn't change my exercise regimen Rather, it motivated me to do more. My rationale was since I couldn't impact what was going on with my neurological system, I could strengthen my muscles to offset these deficiencies. When I retired in 2003, I was feeling the loss of working with a group of peers and needed to connect outside of my home. And once again, the new YMCA in Orleans became an important part of my life and provided a new sense of community. At this point in time, my MS had not progressed and I was able to attend most fitness classes and pick up my equipment and set myself up. As my MS progressed and I started to use a cane, a funny thing happened. The weight class on Monday morning at 9 a.m., all the equipment I needed for Masa Core, a weight training class, started to appear before I got into the class. You have to know there's lots of equipment for this class, including two sets of weights, a fit on a bar, a mat, a step, and risers. A group of women take it upon themselves to get all the equipment out before the class starts, and at the end of the class, it's all put away with military precision. On Wednesday morning, I tend Aquafit in the pool, and my water buddies help me with all the paraphernalia that I need for the pool. This exercise has enormous benefits, especially on a hot July day in Ottawa when the humidity soars. And we all know how challenging that is for a person that lives with MS. 
in the pool, I can get my heart rate up and not worry about losing my balance and I can stretch more easily at the end of my workout. And what is more fun than splashing around in the water with a different group of buddies? Whoever thinks Aquafit is not, has not attended a workout like I do. On Friday morning, a few weeks ago, I started a bar class, B-A-R-R-E, not B-A-R, which is a fusion of Pilates, yoga, strength, and stability. This is a great workout for my legs. They certainly ached after week one, strengthens my core, and improves balance, which is so important in fall prevention. In the past, I've taken Zumba, a fusion of Latin and international dance, and boxing skills. Zumba is a bit of a challenge since there is a lot of footwork, but I adapt as required. When everyone else is turning I, in a circle, I do all the moves in one place. In boxing skills, I realize that boxing, in addition to being a physical workout, helps cognition since you must remember all the different moves. Jab, cross, uppercut, and more. And you need to learn to develop your offensive and defensive strategies. It also helps balance and upper body strength. I certainly did not float like a butterfly or sting like a bee to quote Muhammad Ali, the great boxer, but I had lots of fun. I did yoga for many years at the Y, which not only was good for my body and mind, but also helped me strength for many, also required a certain amount of strength for many of the poses. It was also a wonderful way to quiet the monkey mind. All of these exercise options have similar benefits, including increased strength, balance, coordination, cardio fitness, which are critical to enhancing my physical and mental well-being. These are benefits, but so are the psychosocial elements. It includes a new sense of community, a supportive network, and the increased self-esteem that comes with these activities. The important, it is, the important point to note is that I modify the exercise to accommodate my disability and it works because of the assistance of the other participants and the instructors. I will admit painting a rosy picture of my physical activity, however there are challenges. For example, I started last week with a weight training class on Monday. By Wednesday morning my right ache was very painful and walking was a challenge that continued until Friday. Night spasms ruined my sleep on Sunday night, so Monday was another write-off. Today, I was working on this presentation, so I didn't make it into the pool. We have to remember that the unpredictability of MS and the associated symptoms can wreak havoc to our best laid plans, and that means I don't always get my workout in. As I said at the beginning, this is my experience, and I appreciate there are challenges that I may have not addressed. I'm able to drive myself to the Y, pay for a Y membership, and the environment, both physical and people, has adapted to my needs. I will offer thoughts on this in a bit. I want to talk a little bit about my involvement in research and switch gears. In 2000, I participated in the PROMISE trial that was studying whether Copaxone, a disease-modifying treatment, used for relapse remit multiple sclerosis would be effective for treating primary progressive MS. The study found that Copaxone was not effective in treating primary progressive MS and this was a disappointment. Remember, this was the early years in MS research, lots more was to come. As the years went on during my yearly appointments with my neurologist, he and I would discuss other DMT trials and after reviewing the screening criteria, it was determined that I was not eligible. So I decided I needed to take a holistic approach to living with MS rather than focusing simply on DMTs. This included acupuncture, Feldenkrais, a type of alternative exercise therapy that I did at the Riverside Hospital, regular massages, and physiotherapy to deal with back issues caused by my awkward gait and spasticity. In April 2018, while volunteering at the MS Walk at Tani's Pasture, I noticed a table of researchers from the University of Ottawa. It was Dr. Paludi and her team from the CEPL recruiting people with MS to participate in the research studies. We chatted, and a few weeks later, I enrolled in the DYNE and Uplift research studies. I took part in the DYNE study that looked at the diets of people with MS and involved 
tracking my food consumption over a period of days. This proved enlightening, especially when the tracking period included the May long weekend. I will admit that my food consumption was not exemplary that weekend, and I advise the researcher this was not a reflection of my usual eating habits. Mm -hmm. In June 2018, 2018, I participated in the Uplift study that examined upper extremity function using novel testing. Basically, I had to try to hit a number of electronic balls with robotic arms that I could not see on a large lit table. Much harder than it sounds. The goal of this project was to better understand how upper limb function is affected in people with MS across the disability spectrum and design in order to design rehabilitation interventions. In August 2018, I enrolled in the MS informed study at Queen's University School of Rehabilitation, a study on resources for fatigue management. As we know, fatigue and MS is a very common, so this was of great interest to me. This involved three telephone interviews and access to a website with information on fatigue. Later this year, I plan on enrolling in the RAMP study at, at Dr. Paludi's lab that will look at how the body responds to different types of adapted exercise for people with MS that are wheelchair users. Why do I participate in research studies? MS research has always been of interest to me since it provided me the opportunity to contribute in a different way. Truth be told, it's not totally altruistic, since the findings of the research will help me live my best life and also keep, help others in their MS journey. With the PROMISE trial in 2000, I was seeing it as an opportunity to assist in the development of a therapy for progressive MS, and that I felt I was doing something to change the course of MS and making a bit of a difference. I still feel that, and through the most recent research study, I'm learning more about enhancing my well-being. When asked to talk about, speak about current research that excites me, I decided to limit my selection to three research initiatives. The research field has gained significant momentum over the last few years, and the progress is accelerating in a number of dynamic areas. In August of 2018, the MS Society of Canada announced the funding of a multi-center international clinical trial in improving cognition in progressive MS, led by Dr. Anthony Feinstein at Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto. Over 70% of people with MS suffer cognitive dysfunction, and this study will test the hypothesis that a combined approach of exercise and cognitive rehabilitation will improve cognitive function. This is a collaborative team grant that includes sites in Canada, the USA, the UK, Belgium, Italy, and Denmark. In November 2018, the MS Society of Canada announced the creation of the Canadian Proactive Cohort for People Living with Multiple Sclerosis CanProQuo Can -Pro -Co initiative. In this study, a group of researchers and clinicians will observe a large group of people living with MS from across Canada over a five-year period and will collect specific information from them will identify characteristics of MS. These characteristics will look at why and how progression occurs. This knowledge aims to improve diagnosis, treatment, long-term monitoring, and potential prevention of progression in MS. The CanProCo will also serve as a rich source of information and resources available to other expert MS as well as other neurological diseases for ongoing research. And last but definitely not least, and Dr. Paludi talked a little bit about, the pa over the past six years, the International Progressive Alliance, of which the MS Society of Canada is a founding member, has introduced energy urgency, and direction into the field of progressive MS. In May 2018, 225 researchers from 16 countries gathered in Toronto for the International Progressive Alliance Third Scientific Congress, making a difference through rehabilitation and symptom management. And I was honored to introduce Dr. Feinstein at the opening dinner. This was a very exciting symposium because it set the stage for the development of a global research strategy for well-being that will improve the quality of life for people with progressive MS worldwide. 
The Alliance has formed an international team of experts focused on focusing on setting research priorities and building a roadmap through 2025. I was also asked to consider some of the th questions that researchers should consider when developing exercise study. And they may want to consider the following. Researchers need to pinpoint the barriers to physical activity and identify ways to overcome these barriers. These include lack of accessible exercise facilities, minimal or conflicting advice from healthcare professionals, fatigue, fear, and, appre and appre apprehension. Accessibility to exercise must be considered not only from a building standards perspective, but making it available to all people with MS regardless of their level of disability. People with MS that are non-ambulatory face a unique set of challenges. Their needs include adaptive tailor-made exercises and accessible environments to help incorporate physical activity into their home or workplace and must be considered when developing interventions. Also, how do you motivate someone who may have never exercised and is now living with a disability to start now? What would be the tipping point that will encourage them to start exercising? How do you impart to them the benefits of physical activity, both physical and psycho psychological, including a sense of accomplishment, increased social participation, and feelings of self-management and control? Let us not forget the caregiver who needs to be included in the conversation and integrated into the program. Caregivers are the forgotten ones and their needs should be addressed and they can assist in motivating the person with MS. Once a person with MS has undertaken a new physical activity program, researchers need to think about the motivation required to sustain it on a long-term basis. Exploring new models for exercises-based programs that will empower people with MS to maintain a healthy lifestyle is paramount to enhancing their quality of life and empowering them to live their best life with MS. I appreciate this is a comprehensive list of challenges for consideration. I am confident that the expertise of MS researchers enable them, will ensure that they find solutions to these issues. And finally, my last bit of humor. And this is for Dr. Feinstein. I've been working out for six months, but for all my gains have been in cognitive function. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marie, so much for sharing your experience and um, your thoughts and everything that's been going on, specifically taking a look even more at progressive MS. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Our next speaker, um, Marie has set us up for our, both of our next speakers, actually. Um, and we didn't even talk about that. Um, so our next speaker is going to talk to us about caregivers and uh, people with MS. Uh, we have Dr. Falashide Fakulare. She's a postdoctoral fellow in uh, the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences and works in the Clinical Exercise Physiology Lab. She's a physiotherapist by training with expertise in neural rehabilitation, and she received her PhD in rehabilitation science from Queen's University. She, um, the fundamental question underlying her research is how can we support people affected with advanced disability arising from chronic ne neurological conditions, particularly MS, to lead active and healthy lives within their community. And the particularly unique feature about her research is the inclusion of both people living with MS and their support partners as active and collaborating participants in um, the intervention process. Um, so Dr. Fakulati is going to talk a little bit more about dyadic health interventions or physical activity together.
All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for inviting me today to talk about uh, my research program. So as many of you in this room are aware, uh, people with MS experience a wide variety of symptoms and impairments, uh, which range from problems with gait and balance, as Marie was talking about, uh, to increased depression and anxiety. Uh, all of these symptoms and impairments uh, result in loss of of reduced ability to engage in activities of daily living, as well as reduced quality of life. And the impact of this disease is typically supported by the caregivers in order to reduce uh, the impact that people with MS experience as a result of these symptoms. And uh, this graph, or this figure, is from a study by Ruth Ann Marie and her group out of the University of Manitoba. And what they did was compared individuals without MS to individuals with MS. So individuals without MS are, are represented by the red line, and individuals with MS are represented by the black line. And what they show is that about 30% uh, of individuals with MS from the ages of between 20 and 29 already need a caregiver because of their disability. And when you compare that to individuals without MS, uh, they, who don't need a caregiver until they're about 60s or 65, so essentially older adults, which then increases as they grow older. Uh, but people with MS, 30% of them already need a caregiver at a young age, and that proportion increases to about 60% by the time they're in their 40s or 50s. And so MS caregivers are spending, or support partners, as I prefer to call them, not really caregivers, but the literature calls them caregivers, so I will use that term today. So MS support partners or caregivers are spending a significant amount of time providing sometimes what is complex care to a person with MS. And so in terms of the profile, who are these MS caregivers? Uh, this is from a study that was published uh, quite a bit of uh, a time ago in 2008. And what it shows is that majority of the caregivers of people with MS are spouses who live with their care recipients and that they provide uh, care for an extended period of time, as I said. Uh, the mean in this study was about 13 years spent providing care to a person with MS. Uh, we also know that MS caregivers provide a wide range of uh, caregiving activities, ranging from meal preparation to more complex things like ambulation within and outside the home. Indeed, we know that about 50 to 90% of MS caregivers will be involved in these caregiving um, activities. And although there are um, beneficial uh, impacts to providing care for a person with MS, including um, increased relationship satisfaction, for instance, or increased relationship quality, we also know that the negative impact of providing extended periods of uh, care for a person, I'm so sorry. For a person with MS, um, there's negative impacts associated with that. And so MS caregivers have reported increased anxiety, increased fatigue, sleep disorders, pain, and reduced quality of life. And sometimes the proportion of caregivers reporting this um, negative impacts have been close or almost more than the proportion of people with MS actually reporting uh, this negative impact. And so, as we've heard today, physical activity is emerging as one of the ways of managing the impact of the disease. And as Dr. Piluti alluded, there's a lot of research that has gone on over the last uh, decade or so, exploring or elucidating how physical activity can be used as a management strategy for um, multiple sclerosis. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, physical activity in a dyadic context. And so, for a definition, uh, dyads are very simply defined as two people who are involved in a socially significant relationship. And so we could have dyads that are related biologically. So when we look at siblings or parents and their children, that would be a biological relationship. They could also be related by acquisition, which I found very interesting, like you acquire your, your spouse kind of thing. <laughs> so they could also be related by acquisition. Uh, best friends or spouses would be acquisition. All right, so in terms of dyadic health interventions, uh, what those are, are interventions that are focused on both partners in the dyad as um, either in a way of the caregiver assisting the person with MS to carry out those intervention strategies or the person with MS and the caregivers being together in the intervention addressing both their needs. 
So in terms of what uh, the benefits of dietic uh, physical activity interventions, a lot of studies have started to look at this in the Alzheimer's population uh, or in people with more other chronic uh, diseases like cancer or cardiac um, rehabilitation groups. And so this is a fairly recent um, uh, mechanism or a fairly recent attention uh, focus that's been on in the research world. And what we know from those studies in other chronic conditions or other uh, health conditions is that dietic physical activity programs, again, those are programs that target both people with the condition and their caregivers as active and collaborating partners. Those programs lead to increased physical activity levels in both partners. We also know that there's an improved physical function and mental um, health, so cognitive uh, abilities and executive function and, and, and things like that. We also know that the caregivers who participated in these types of interventions um, said that they were able to better cope with managing the impact of the disease on themselves. And we saw that uh, there was increased enjoyment and increased adherence to the exercise interventions. And this is a very major problem because a lot of studies uh, that do show that exercise is beneficial they all struggle with the same concept of how do we ensure that people continue to exercise, how do we ensure that people uh, continue to maintain whatever behavior change that they have achieved. We also saw that people, again, feeding into that enjoyment and adherence is that they expressed interest in continuing to participate in such programs even after the intervention period was over. So that's all very good. Uh, however, this research is to a large extent unprecedented in the MS literature. So we know much less about what happens with exercise or physical activity uh, in the life of caregivers. We know less about what happens in the dietic context uh, relative to physical activity. And so our group is really pioneering this idea that we need to focus beyond the individual with MS and extend that um, benefits of physical activity to the caregivers in that dietic context. And so we're conducting the first of its kind, the first randomized uh, pilot randomized control trial to begin to um, explore this idea in the MS um, world. And this is a collaborative effort with our colleagues, uh, Dr. Mark Friedman from University of Ottawa and Monsieur Finlayson out of the uh, Queen's University. This study uh, is looking at uh, focusing on advanced multiple sclerosis, again, because a lot of the interventions, as Dr. Piluti had alluded to, focuses on people with uh, more uh, in the lower end of the disability spectrum. And we really know much less about what happens as the disability progresses beyond um, mild to moderate disability. And so we're focusing on advanced MS. It's going to be a 12-week program where we have six uh, group sessions. And we're really looking at leveraging uh, the impact of technology in uh, providing widespread dissemination and access to this program. So we're going to be delivering the intervention via group teleconferencing. And that's a fancy word for telephone, group telephone sessions. Uh, we're also going to be including behavioral coaching and strategies to encourage change in health behavior. And this is important because we know that if it, an intervention is theory-based, uh, it they tend to be more effective than those interventions without a theory base. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, behavioral strategies that we're including in this intervention in a short while. So in terms of our outcomes, as a feasibility study, we're really looking at if this intervention is safe for both people with MS and their caregivers, uh, if it's acceptable, so in terms of their experiences participating in this intervention, in terms of um, the ac acceptability of this intervention. Uh, our primary efficacy outcome that we want to, we hope to see a change in is physical activity level. So we're going to measure that uh, both subjectively and objectively uh, in both partners. We're also, thinking, uh, we're also looking at how the intervention will help psychological functioning. So we're looking at things like coping, things like resilience, things like uh, self-confidence and self-efficacy to continue to engage in the behavior after the intervention session. We're also looking at participatory outcomes, so quality of life, relationship quality between the person with MS and their caregivers, as well as things like perception of the social support that both uh, parties experience or receive uh, in the dyadic relationship. 
So I said that I was going to talk about some of the behavioral strategies that we're including in this intervention, and this is really uh, giving practical tips to uh, diets who may be in the house who may want to engage in physical activity together with their care recipients or caregivers. So one of the major ones that we're using in this intervention is goal setting. And I know a lot of people know what goal setting is, but just to go over that again, uh, goal setting is defined in terms of the behavior to be enacted. So in this case, that will be physical activity or in terms of the outcome of the behavior. So in this case, it might be engaging in physical activity uh, because you want to have uh, more energy or less fatigue. So one of the examples of a goal statement, we're encouraging participants in this study to set goals that are very specific regarding what they want to change. Uh, we're also encouraging them to set goals that are relevant to them. And so one of the goal statements uh, that is here is, I will increase my minutes of physical activity by 40% from a baseline of 20 minutes per week to 28 minutes over the 12-week period of the intervention. And we decided to focus on goal setting because evidence has shown from uh, systematic reviews, from primary studies, that if you set a goal that is specific, that is uh, attainable, that is measurable, you're more likely to then um, engage in the behavior. So we're trying to leverage uh, that behavioral strategy and encourage people to set goals. The other thing that's interesting about this study is that we're encouraging people to set goals in the context of a diet. So setting goals together, not necessarily the same goals, because we understand that people with MS may have symptoms that prevent them from engaging in physical activity at the same rate as their caregivers uh, who may not have such symptoms. But what we want is that they're collaborating together and heading in the same direction. So one person might say, I want to do 30 minutes of physical activity, and the other person might say, I want to do 10 minutes of physical activity. The point is that they're both improving their physical activity levels or they're both setting goals to improve their physical activity levels. So the other uh, behavioral strategy that we're using in this um, intervention is action planning and that really involves very detailed plans about how the behavior will be enacted. So we're asking people to think about what, where, uh, when and how the actions will be carried out as well as the kind of resources that they need to uh, carry out these behaviors. So I'll give you an example. Um, in terms of looking at what, when, where, and how, we're asking them to uh, plan or write out plans like, I will set out time in the evening right before dinner to attend an aqua fit class in a community center with my partner. So I was very excited when uh, Marie mentioned about the aqua fit class. So. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, we're also asking them to think about resources that they may need to then engage in this activity. So do you need to have a, a membership at a community center? How affordable is that membership? Uh, do you need to buy equipment and, and stuff like that? So I'm going to touch a bit on uh, the types of action planning and what that looks like or what that means uh, in our study. So we have two types of action planning. It could be individual planning where one person, even though in a diet, decides on what they want to do for themselves. Or it could be dyadic planning, in which case both members work together or, and create a plan for them to jointly uh, be physically active. So in terms of research uh, support for this, we know that action planning does increase the likelihood of engaging in the behavior. So action planning is one of the ways that you can bridge that gap between I intend to participate in a behavior and actually doing what you intend to do. Uh, we also know that people who plan together with someone else, so it could be your spouse, it could be your friend, plan together the kind of activity and how you want to engage in that activity, we know that those people uh, tend to enact the plan that they actually come up with better than those who plan on their own. And so we're leveraging those kinds of um, strategies into, in this intervention. So I'm going to end by take home messages that I hope that you've gained from this brief talk is that dyadic physical activity and uh, programs that target both people with MS and their caregivers together have the potential to um, affect or influence the health outcomes of both parties and looking beyond just the person with MS to those people around that person who offer the most support for that person with MS and how we can address health outcomes of both parties. Um, also that strategies like goal planning, goal setting and action planning 
have been shown to be effective in promoting uh, intentions and then in addressing that gap between intentions and actual performance of the behavior. Um, I'm going to say thank you for inviting me again. Um, Lisa wanted me to announce that there's room for questions at the end, so we'll have all the speakers speak, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. All right, I'm pleased to introduce our last speaker, Dr. John Farrell, who is also a postdoctoral fellow in, uh, with our research group. He received his PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Oklahoma in the Human Performance Laboratory. Um, and his research there focused on the evaluation of bilateral asymmetry, so differences between the limbs in people with MS, and exploring how that's physiologically uh, manifested by people with MS, affecting walking, balance, gait, things like that. His research now focuses on developing exercise training interventions for managing strength and gait asymmetry in people with MS. And Dr. Farrell holds fellowship funding from the University of Ottawa um, CHEO Research Institute Collaborative Initiative. So um, this evening, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome Dr. John Farrell, and he's going to talk a little bit more about um, some innovative approaches, strategies in the delivery of exercise for people with MS. Can y'all hear me? All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pluto, for that very nice introduction. So, as we've heard tonight, there is a large amount of evidence, a high level of evidence, to support benefits of persons with multiple sclerosis participating in physical activity and exercise training. So much so that guidelines were developed to ensure that individuals were participating in the proper duration of exercise and the, trying to obtain the right exercise intensity to see those reported benefits. So analyses have shown that despite, these, uh, despite the evidence for these benefits and these guidelines, 80% of persons of MS do not meet those recommended guidelines. Now, Marie kind of beat me to the punch on this earlier. <laughs> but really what we're trying to do is we're tr in order to change this behavior, we have to identify the barriers that are preventing individuals with MS from participating in physical exercise and uh, activity. So the key barriers that have been identified previously are physical limitations and the accessibility of these programs. So it's not just enough to identify these, but to also come up with strategies to overcome these barriers. So how do we do this? These are the questions that we are trying to address at the University of Ottawa. Our first strategy is looking at adaptive exercise modalities for individuals that do have physical limitations to be able to continue to participate in exercise and physical activity. Also, trying to increase the accessibility of these programs. How can we leverage technology to deliver this information and to deliver uh, help and strategies to incorporate more physical activity into their daily lifestyle? So I'd like to first talk about some of our research that we've done with adaptive exercise modalities and talk about the research that we are currently doing. And specifically, I want to talk about functional electrical stimulation cycling, or FES. FES is an adaptive exercise modality that has been done or has been researched in other conditions such as spinal cord injuries, but as of right now, there's very little research in its use in persons with MS. And the way this exercise modality works is it provides an additional or it provides an electrical, a mild electrical stimulus to muscles via an electrode placed on the skin. And what this does is allows individuals to produce a muscle contraction during a cycling exercise. Now, our group was the first to conduct a pilot randomized control trial looking at the effects of FES cycling in persons with MS with severe disability. And I'd like to talk about some of those results, but first I want to orient you to a couple of these figures. So on our y-axis, we have our measurements. So in this instance, we have aerobic fitness and we have lower limb strength. 
we have our two groups, the group that received the FES cycling. In our control group, the white bar indicates our baseline measurements. The black bar indicates our post measurements. So this study was conducted over 24 weeks. So the individuals in the FES group, they received 24 weeks of functional electrical stimulation cycling exercising. And we saw, a bit of a mouthful, and we saw that compared to the control group, we saw larger improvements in aerobic fitness and lower limb strength. And if you notice, the control groups actually, or the control group actually decreased in both of these measurements. And then if we also look at mobility outcomes, so walking speed and walking endurance, again, we saw larger improvements following FES uh, cycling compared to the control group for both measurements. And again, we actually saw a small decrease in our control group. Now, to build upon these findings, our, our research team is conducting a larger uh, randomized controlled trial that is, again, 24 weeks in duration, where we're going to be looking at the effects of FES cycling on mobility outcomes, physiological adaptations, and cognitive function. This will be in collaboration with our colleagues, uh, Dr. Walker and Dr. Friedman. And this is also funded by the MS Society of Canada. So as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, this is the expanded disability status scale. For those of you who are not, this is a scale that is used to rate disability in persons with MS. And it's already been alluded to a couple of times this evening that a large amount of the literature looking at the benefits of exercise training and physical activity in persons with MS has been done in mild to moderate disability, with very little research done in, in higher disability levels. So this really hinders our ability to provide appropriate exercise recommendations for individuals that are in the severe disability range. So to address this issue, our laboratory is conducting one of the first uh, studies looking at the physiological responses to adaptive exercise modalities in individuals with severe uh, disability. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the individual responses utilizing three exer adaptive exercise modalities. These include arm ergometry, recumbent stepper, and our FES cycles that we previously mentioned. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to look at the physiological demands of each one of these exercises, the cognitive demands, as well as the participants' experience using these exercise modalities. It doesn't really make sense for us to recommend these if nobody enjoys using them. Okay. So the second strategy that I alluded to, and Marie alluded to as well, is, making, is increasing accessibility of programs. So uh, Dr. Fleshday alluded to it a little bit. How can we leverage technology to better deliver information and to better deliver strategies for individuals to incorporate physical activity into their daily lifestyle? Dr. Plutti mentioned that physical activity is really about increasing your movement throughout the day. How can I move more throughout my day? And this can be through uh, activities associated with leisure, occupation, and travel, so that individuals don't necessarily have to participate in formal exercise training. So how can we leverage technology and deliver this information to make it more accessible for everybody? So using the internet, which I'm sure almost all of us have used at some point in our life at this stage, we were able, our, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of Illinois, we were able to deliver a, or provide information pertaining to how to increase physical activity and strategies for increasing physical activity in everyday life to individuals with multiple sclerosis using the internet. And so what we saw is that there was a 30 minute increase per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. There was an increase of around 1800 steps per day. And there was a decrease in sitting time by 99 minutes per day. So showing that technology can be used in an effective manner to deliver this information. So we're trying to take it one step further. So physical activity has been shown to be an effective strategy for managing uh, comorbidities in the general population. And as we can see, or 
individuals that have multiple sclerosis are susceptible to developing comorbidities. This figure is showing the prevalence of various comorbidities five years prior to diagnosis in blue, and then the prevalence of comorbidities at diagnosis in red. And all of these having all of these increased at diagnosis. So why should we be worried about the development of these comorbidities for persons of MS? Well, they've been associated with the uh, rapid development of disability and increased mortality rate. So physical activity, as I mentioned, has been shown to be effective in managing comorbidities in the general population, and specifically has been effective in managing cardiovascular disease risk factors. So what we're trying to do with our uh, study is we're trying to look at if physical activity, uh, deliver, information delivered about physical activity via the internet is an effective strategy for managing the development of cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. So all of this information will be delivered through the internet. Individuals can talk with uh, members of our research team about having to leave their home and basically just try to incorporate those strategies into their lifestyle and we will talk with them and how to overcome some of the barriers that they may be facing when it comes to those strategies. So I'd like to leave with just a couple of take home messages from this, okay? There is increased research in adaptive exercise modalities and in individuals that have severe disability. Now, the increase in this research will hopefully lead to more pieces of adaptive exercise equipment becoming more available. We are already starting to see this at some of the local uh, health facilities. It's not uncommon to see recumbent steppers and arm ergometers. And we're starting to see an increase in activity programs that are available. Uh, this is a uh, chair yoga. It allows individuals to go through yoga poses and using a chair for support. And this is offered at the Jack Purcell Community Center. We also have the Ottawa Power Wheelchair Hockey League. They also will provide adaptive equipment for individuals to use uh, when they're signed up for the league. Um, the Ottawa Capitals actually won the national championship, the Canadian national championship in July. We actually had a couple of these games streaming in our office at the time. And also, just because you're not able to participate in formal exercise training or you don't have access to the equipment per se or you don't want to travel to the equipment, that doesn't mean you can't see health benefits by increasing your physical activity levels. Incorporating more movement into your daily life through leisure activities, travel, or occupation can still see significant health benefits. And we're trying to develop uh, innovative ways to deliver this information, leveraging technology so that we can further increase the accessibility of this information for all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. There have been a lot of myths in multiple sclerosis over the years. And I know that when I got into this a few years ago, what did they say? Uh, never have children. Uh, don't go out in the sun. Avoid the hot tub. And for God's sake, don't exercise. We've come a long way, haven't we? We've learned a lot. You can have babies. In fact, sometimes pregnancy is one of the best treatments for multiple sclerosis. One of the reasons people are believing that we have such a high incidence of MS in Canada is because we don't go out in the sun, or we have so little of it, or people are afraid to get cold. Uh, so maybe vitamin D or some other sun-related element is important. Uh, they used to do the hot tub test for MS, but certainly we can enjoy the hot tub. And now you're learning that exercise is, is so paramount to uh, the improvements that we can generate with medicines. But without the exercise, the medicines are probably like this, 
and with the exercise, it benefits greatly. And I think this is true for many of the diseases you're going to hear about during this week. Uh, I don't think that there's any neurological condition that I know of that has yet to not benefit from exercise. And I think the work that uh, Dr. Paludi has done to show us that, in fact, it is safe to do this, and there are ways in which we can do it um, not only safely but efficiently uh, at all stages of MS, particularly those who have already acquired certain disabilities, especially through some of the means that you just heard about from Dr. Farrell. So uh, this is just a tidbit of some of the work that goes on with uh, the research in multiple sclerosis. Before I uh, talk a little bit more generally, I thought we would open the floor to some questions. There are microphones in the um, walkways here, so I would encourage you to use these. And uh, then if you have, and for any of the speakers tonight, don't be afraid. Or if it's difficult for you to get to a microphone, we'll get it to you. Yep. While you're thinking about it, <laughs> <laughs> while you're thinking about it, so so much of this uh, research is funded by uh, various charities and organizations, and it's never enough, as you know. Uh, the MS Society of Canada supports a lot, but it can't support everything. We turn away, I'm going to guess, about 30 percent of the grant requests at least each year from researchers. We have no source really from uh, the government agencies are pushing us away from things like CIHR. They would prefer us to go to the MS Society because it's so disease specific. And we come to institutions and they have limited funds. The brain health. Oh, we have a question. Yeah, we actually have a question, um, an online question, which is oh, very exciting. Excellent. Our first one ever. So, <laughs> I'll read that. Well, let's. Let, I'm going to stop okay. and take the question. Okay, thank you. Who is it? This directed to? Uh, I'll just read it, and you can let me know, Dr. Friedman. Okay. This is from Mike. Um, from a reduction in symptoms perspective, which has been shown to be most promising with MS patients, exercise or drug therapy. That's a tough one. I mean, symptoms are very generalized. We have medications for symptoms, but it depends on what symptoms that we're talking about. I guess in terms of some of the things you've seen here tonight, like the, one of the commonest symptoms is, uh, is fatigue. And, and I would think that exercise is going to benefit that greatly. Uh, some of the other concerns about depression and cognitive dysfunction, those are also extremely common amongst MS patients. You heard some of the initiative tonight that is going to try to link exercise uh, and improve cognition. This is a worldwide effort led by our own uh, Tony Feinstein in Toronto. So there, there are certainly uh, thoughts that exercise will improve symptoms if done properly. Other online questions? This is exciting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's great. So uh, well, as I was, oh, I'm sorry. You can come Talk up here and use the mic. I'm curious whether there's been any um, assessments of impact of cardiovascular exercise versus weight training. Um, because you had described other associations with heart disease and such and other comorbidities. I'm just curious what that, if there's been any assessment comparing either or. So and, um, it really depends on what the outcome is. So traditionally, our cardiovascular modes of exercise would be most effective for improving things like aerobic fitness and also modifying a lot of those cardiovascular disease risk factors where we tend to use more resistance-based or strength-based approaches to um, improve muscular strength. But both of them have been done in the context of a lot of the symptom management that Dr. Friedman was just talking about here. Um, in the context of mobility, there have been some comparisons there. And 
Um, there seems to be some benefit a little bit more for the aerobic types of exercise and um, always those that are more specific to the type of outcome that you're trying to improve tend to be the most effective. So if you're trying to improve walking, those types of exercises that are most targeted towards walking types of behaviors and improving aerobic fitness would be most effective. Hello, thank you all so much for the presentation. Um, quick question about healthcare providers. Um, given that the research, as you mentioned, in the past couple of years has been pretty progressive in accepting exercise as a form of therapy, have you found that exercise or healthcare providers have actually been eager to take that on, or has there still been some resistance? <laughs> I want to make sure that I understand the question. Is this, um, so you're referring to the physician, of course, that, that we're going to take on leading the exercise program or referring you to these programs? Yeah, I mean, the recommendation, so the recommendation has always been there. The problem in Canada and, and uh, probably throughout the world, but Canada in particular, is that certain governments are not really strongly supportive of these programs, and, uh, and they should be because it, it generates uh, such betterment for the disease that uh, in the end they'll probably end up costing them less money. But this is why some of this that you heard about tonight is going to generate some of this uh, economic, pharmacoeconomic and, and, and rehab economic things that will drive, I think, the governments to support these programs because many patients do not have access or they have to pay out of their own pocket. Marie didn't tell us this, but uh, she's not doing this for free. She's going to these places and, and uh, she's committing funds and not everyone has those funds. And in certain provinces support it to a certain extent, others not at all. So we, we need to get somehow the resources to allow us to be able to do this. So I recommend people go to the Aquafit and they go out to the Liquid Gym and there's Neuro Gym and there's other places where you can go and, and safely exercise. But it's costly and not, uh, not everybody has the insurance or other resources to, to pay for those. Uh, and we need that. And I don't know where that's gonna come from. So I, I certainly recommend it, but it's like telling you to, I, I've got this magic drug, but you can't have it because I don't have it here. So I can make a recommendation, but it's, I have to be responsible for that as well. Do you, do you wanna speak to that, Marie, or? alluded to that when I talked about some of the barriers and that my situation was somewhat different. But there's certain things that we can do, and I co-facilitate a, a group at the uh, MS Society, the local chapter, and talk about something as easy as going for a walk. You know, um, once again, there's uh, the internet, there's the NMSS, the National MS Society, there's a number of programs online that you can do. So we think that it requires money and you need to go to a gym, but I think if you do the research, there's lots of um, ways that you can do it sort of at home safely and, uh, and get the results that you want. So it's just sort of changing our thinking around that. So Dr. Friedman, I have another question here, um, if, if that's I'm just answered. Gonna, one more comment no on that. So on, on the other side of things too, um, some of our collaborators and there's some new task force that are looking at developing, um, we're updating the guidelines essentially. Um, and part of that is we're creating toolkits and resources for the physician and for the provider that um, can provide more information for resources for here's the recommendations that you can give to your patient. So the next question up here would be, um, would delayed onset muscle soreness be more prevalent in individuals MS after the exercise? I'm not clear on that question. Would delayed? Would delayed onset muscle soreness be more prevalent Mu in individual individuals with delayed MS? Delayed onset muscle soreness? After the exercise. Yes, <laughs> DOMS, <laughs> the, uh, so you can have delayed onset muscle soreness that happens about, you know, 48 hours after you exercise that can be due to some of the actual damage that you do to um, the tissues there. Um, so there's not really research that would specifically show that. Um, 
they're looking at, you know, the recording of probably adverse events and some of the symptoms that are experienced afterwards. There's probably more symptoms related to muscular fatigue, but I don't know that we've specifically identified some of those um, timelines probably specifically enough. And I have one more here. Have there been any control studies that have separated exercise and drugs therapy to see the difference? For example, in areas of cognition and fatigue. Mm -hmm. So direct comparison of exercise and drug therapies, is that kind of the concept? Yeah. So, okay, so there's no, there's, there's one clinical, or there's one case study so far that's looked at a comparison of uh, drug therapy to exercise. So we don't have any large studies that we'd be comparing drug therapies to exercise. And again, it would really depend on what the outcome is that we're looking at. So the one case study is actually looked at um, Ampura, which is a drug for uh, mobility and walking and to improve mobility. And um, that case study was looking at um, exercise. Um, so it looked at exercise as well as Ampura. Um, and they did find that there were some benefits relative to walking that were um, independent of, uh, so there were benefits of both therapies and um, there was a combined effect there as well. I have one up here as well, but this is live. Well, just to answer to that last one, Ampira is a uh, medication actually for fatigue, but I think the... Famperdine, yes, okay. that's, the fa that's the American okay. name. Yeah. Uh, but I think the question may have alluded to disease-modifying therapy versus uh, exercise, and uh, that would be an almost impossible study to be done today because it would mean people going without the medication. Instead, what we've seen is what the benefit is of an add-on exercise program to the medicine versus not exercising, and it's very clear that the combination is better. Hi. Uh, I've had MS for a very long time. I've gone through knee replacements, cancer, and everything, and I've, I'm so tired all the time. How do I exercise? I try very hard, but it's very difficult. So I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's a very challenging situation, and I know the one that lots of people are facing. So um, I think you just have to find out whatever the best strategies that work for you, taking an individualized approach. So um, just thinking about what some other patient experiences, you know, finding perhaps there's the best time of day that might be ideal for you to exercise or be more active. Um, finding a certain type of exercise that might be most effective for you and is maybe less fatiguing. So I think it's just a matter of kind of figuring out what would be the best approach for you and always kind of listening to your body, taking it slow, and, and progressing slowly over time. I am wary of the time, and, and we are running a little bit late. But I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. And for those of you who are here every night for Brain Health Awareness Week, thank you for, for attending. And for those online, uh, also thank you for attending. Uh, what I was saying earlier with regards to the support, you heard at the very beginning tonight that this is uh, a support of the MS pillar, which is a an important facet of the uh, University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Institute, which is really launching these pillars to try to generate the kind of research that you heard tonight, which can only be done with getting researchers who may not even know that they're here and uh, uh, able to do something for a disease like multiple sclerosis from all over the city and the region to get together. And, and that pillar needs your help in any way you can through either personal or through people you know that will support this and keep Ottawa really at the forefront